Joes, and as you have stated earlier, you are the present chairman of the commercial law department of the field chair. I was, uh, Your Honor, until I accepted, I, uh, until I accepted the chairmanship of the Governance Commission, I thought it was not fair uh, that devoting all my full time to the GCG, I should retain the chairmanship of the commercial law department of field So you left field already? Yes, uh, Your Honor. When? When? when um, le uh, last year, Your Honor, shortly before I, I assumed the chairmanship of the Governance Commission, Your Honor. Ah, I see. Anyway, you have been involved in the PILJA. Now, what is your vision for the PILJA if you will become the next Chief Justice of the Supreme Court? Right. I've been involved. I was pro fortunate enough to be with PILJA. At the time, it rose to heights under Justice Amorfina Melencia Herrera, and then was with it when, the, when uh, Justice uh, uh, Ascuna took over. Mm -mm. And um, Field is, uh, is very much respected by many, many international agencies that are offering uh, reforms, and they always go to Field to do that. And it has been revitalized and extended that it is truly uh, one of the great uh, pillars right now of the Supreme Court. Well, could it be uh, greater? Of course it would, uh, Your Honor. We were, uh, the, before I left the commercial law de department, uh, Your Honor, we were tinkering with being able to regionalize Filja. In other words, uh, we, we were thinking of being able to put up satellite offices and a satellite organization in each of the judicial regions in our country and for them to be responsive to the areas that were there. We were seeing that some of the programs that were relevant to some people uh, some of the judges in one region were irrelevant to the others, and therefore, so much uh, funding of the Supreme Court was going into all of this trading program. We wanted to make sure, therefore, that Filja began to be uh, important, responsive uh, in each of the region by doing regional one, and, and to be able to train within each of the regions not only an organization but some of the uh, core professors who would be known to who would have decided to devote their, their, their careers in, in the province, Your Honor. That's one area, Your Honor. Okay, thank you very much, Dean. Now, let's go to another point, Dean. It is given that the, two, that the two political branches of government, namely the executive and the legislative, have the primary responsibility of promoting the economic well-being of our country. A former Chief Justice once said that the judiciary has a similar duty to nurture prosperity and alleviate poverty in our country. Do you agree? Dean? I agree, Your Honor. Very much so. Okay. Now, if you will be the next Chief Justice, how can the courts uh, nurture prosperity and alleviate poverty in our country? The, uh, unlike, uh, well, our Supreme Court is in a unique position compared to the Federal Supreme Court in the sense that our Constitution, in fact, has economic and commercial precepts and policies. Yes. Therefore, the Supreme Court has often said that it is not their choice when it, cannot, it comes to economic policy. It's not their choice that they should uh, have a say in it. It's, it's their bounded duty to ensure that the economic policies within the Supreme Court are, are followed. Um, I, I wrote uh, on this, uh, Your Honor, on the philosophical underpinning of, uh, of the commercial law provisions of the Constitution, and I said, you, you notice, compared to American Constitution, our Constitution has needed to have economic policies, mainly because uh, we're a country that's trying to find its way. We are not a developed, uh, we, we're merely a developing country, and therefore it was imperative for our, our writers to put in what they felt were the uh, aspirations of a nation. But I did say there that the economic terms of the Constitution are not addressed solely and alone and primarily to the, con to the Supreme Court. They're actually addressed to the policy determining uh, bodies. And therefore, the primary role of moving this country forward of trying to alleviate poverty, of trying to make life better for everyone, is really the primary role of the executive and the legislative. Mm -hmm. And uh, the role of the Supreme Court is not to be to preempt them into this. 
in fact, uh, it should look at what, uh, it should consider that a determination by the executive or legislative branch of a, an economic program is the way to do it. And unless it really is contrary to the constitutional precepts, it should live by this. And unless there's abuse of discretion, the uh, Supreme Court should take this. And then, in areas where um, the members of our society object to uh, the economic policies of uh, our two policy determining bodies, then it is the duty of the Supreme Court in deciding such issues brought before it, not justifiable controversy, to actually find and explain if it is correct uh, the policies, the directions, and the programs that they have been uh, taken up by uh, the both, both uh, policy determining uh, and executing branches of our government. I, to me, that's the role of the Supreme Court to work very closely, at arm's length, but very close uh, to, uh, to work very closely at being able to allow our policy determining and policy executing uh, branches to be able to carry out the work that they have. We must presume that our legislator, it is not just the justices of the Supreme Court who have our country's heart, uh, uh, progress at heart, but primarily also the executive and the legislative arm. Okay. In relation to this, Dean, our new constitution imposes upon the courts not only the power but the duty to strike down all acts committed by any branch or instrumentality of the government uh, with grave abuse of discretion. Yes. What do you think would be the effect or what do you think is the effect of this provision on the courts? Well, it means that uh, on the courts, on the, on the Supreme Court primarily and the courts in general, yes. it means that they have been granted expressly by the, this unique, by this new provision in the uh, 1987 Constitution with uh, a bounding duty to be vigilant, so to speak, um, over um, when it comes to the exercise of powers by both uh, the executive and legislative branches. Mm -hmm. But only when there's a grave abuse of discretion should the courts come in. In other words, they are not supposed to second guess or preempt or to mm -hmm. supplant the policy, the, the determinations of those bodies. Only when mm -hmm. there's a clear showing that indeed they have overstepped, there has been abuse of discretion, do the courts come in? And that's a duty that, that's a very powerful, uh, uh, that, that's a very powerful uh, duty on the part of the, uh, uh, the courts which they must use sparingly unless there's a clear showing of abuse of discretion, Your Honor. Okay, Dean, let's go to another point. Corruption is one of the most serious problems in the judiciary. If you will be the next Chief Justice, how are you going to address this problem? I think the, the more, uh, first of all, Your Honor, the, when there's so much discretion, the, so much vagueness in the rules of procedure and the law, that actually and there's no transparency. That actually engenders corruption. Therefore, the rules have to be streamlined so that there's less discretion uh, and there's a more transparency towards that. I think that's, that's pretty important, Your Honor. Mm -hmm. The other one would be uh, non-tolerance, Your Honor. We, I think that when, uh, when a body uh, comes together, there's a tendency out of self-preservation to try to uh, cross over um, the bad eggs because it affects the institution as a whole. I think that the public realizes that uh, corruption in the judiciary is so bad that there has to be a clear call for it. So I think that the Supreme Court, through its justices, should work very closely with uh, uh, government agencies in order to monitor very carefully through the Anti-Money Laundering Council, through with the NBI, with the Ombudsman, uh, very carefully the, the uh, dual lifestyle checks and all of the judges and justices down the line and to show that uh, indeed uh, there is intolerance, there should be zero tolerance. In the end, Your Honor, we will not be able to stamp out corruption entirely, but we would be able to control it and we would be able to show that if you get caught, you will be prosecuted. I think that's the only way to, to go about it, Your Honor. Okay. This is the last question coming from me because I still have questions from the Twitter. 
Okay, Dean, can you tell us your top three priorities upon assumption of office as the next Chief Justice of the Supreme Court? Well, for, first of all, uh, Your Honor, my top priority would be basically to to unite the uh, Supreme Court. Not only the uh, all the 15 justices together, but also the uh, all those who work with the Supreme Court, many of whom have been my former students, and to be able to what we call do a strategy roadmap. Um, it is my intention to confer with uh, the 15 members of the uh, 14 members of the judiciary because they have been at it for quite a while. They realize the problems that are there. They know they probably have some of the solutions that are there. I have my own uh, assessment, my own inputs. Together we will try to and do what we call uh, a strategic roadmap for the Supreme Court as a whole and for the judiciary as a whole. And then work with the other appellate courts down the line. And, and perhaps there, there is a need to be able to, to solve basically the problem that is at the heart of many of the 15 justices, I have, I've been told that they just carry too much in their dockets, almost inhumanly loaded, that the other thing of moving forward is difficult. And therefore, we will work with them in order to ensure that as much as possible, the Supreme Court becomes a constitutional court, that most of the decision that it goes are matters of constitutional issues, and that the other matters which are, are not precedent setting, there's a way to be able to solve that, to ensure that um, as a matter of practice, it, it is limited to the level of the Court of Appeals. And having deloaded them that, in that case and only concentrating on important uh, cases, uh, Your Honor, perhaps um, it is only fitting that each of the justices become responsible for a judicial region. But for them, they, they will show the face of the Supreme Court in each of the judicial region and do a good job at making sure that the dispensation of justice goes well, that access to, uh, of the poor to justice goes well, that the clogging goes well. The other would be, of course, uh, Your Honor, trying to see how um, the various programs that are in place towards the clogging, the workload of uh, our judges and, uh, and, and justices uh, and, and judges are, is done. Uh, so much has to be done. And I think that this will be resolved by the, by the third item, of being able to recruit the best and the brightest. There are many um, empty salas right now, and, and I think that uh, once you're able to attract into the judiciary some of the best and the brightest, competent, they themselves will know how to and be able to put up a stream how to, de how to handle the court dockets and, be in, and, and work with uh, items like ADR and JDR, Your Honor. Those are the three items that I would look into, Your Honor. Thank you very much, Dean. Now, I will read to you some of the questions from the Twitter. Okay. Okay. Now, I will read it. Considering that the checking of the 